So this is week four, talking about the power of the cross. And one of the things that, that happens through the Bible, the way it works, is it works in patterns. And there are patterns that unfold, and over the last several weeks, talking about the power of the cross, we've talked about one of those patterns being the Day of Atonement, that God... Um, Kipare, right? The verb kipare, um, the day of atonement, that God covers us, that He sees us and He covers our sin. And this other pattern we're going to look at today and next week, actually, is this idea of slavery and exodus, that we are exiles, that we have been stuck in slavery and in bondage, and those captives are set free. And as Romans in that passage right there, uh, there's one word that just appears over and over and over and over, and it's slaves and slavery. And there is this connection um, of slavery that Paul is making to the power of sin. And sin becomes this slave master who controls us. Not the law, right? The law just reveals that we struggle to be obedient to it. It's not the law that makes us sinful. It's the law that reveals that we are sinful people. But Paul uses this idea that we are slaves to sin and that we are becoming as the people of God, as God's children, we are becoming slaves not to sin any longer, but slaves to righteousness. That there is this transition that's happening in our life. Just as they were slaves in Egypt, and Egypt, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, is this embodiment of evil. They have blessing, and they are using that blessing to bring curses on the rest of humanity. They are the embodiment of of evil. They have power, they have authority, and they're not using it to bless other people, but they're using it to harm and oppress people. So this idea of slavery is really rooted in Israel's story. It is rooted in the story of Israel as they were slaves. So God calls this people, Abraham, beginning with Abraham, out of his country and his home and everything he knows and says, we're going to leave, we're going to go become this new nation. And this new nation is going to be different from all of the other nations and that it's going to be a blessing to this world. It's going to take my blessings and it's going to use my blessings to be a blessing to the rest of the world. And the world is going to see my goodness through my people. And that experiment of this new people goes incredibly wrong. Is it kind of culminates towards the end of Genesis, just after Abraham has been called, is a guy named Joseph who has 11 brothers, I guess, there's 12 total, has 11 brothers, and they sell him as a slave. And he finds himself as a slave in Egypt. And this story becomes really this this painful, um, painful experience of the consequences of other people's sin in Joseph's life. Because at the end of the day, Joseph has done, not really done anything wrong. And he finds himself as a slave. And somehow, in the face of that evil and that injustice, God begins to work powerfully in redeeming Joseph's story. Where Joseph rises to become the second most powerful man in all of Egypt, and at the end of the day, ends up saving his family. 
and forgiving them for what they have done to him. But some time goes by, and there's a new Pharaoh, a new king, and he doesn't know Joseph, and he doesn't know all that Joseph has done. And he begins to oppress the Israelite people because they are growing in number. And they become slaves. And they begin to make their life harder and harder. More and more difficult. Until it reaches this climax. Is Israel oppressed and beaten, and with nowhere else to turn, cry out to God. And God comes down and he talks to a man that he's called out named Moses. He talks to him through this burning bush. And he says to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. To bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey. Somehow, the God of the universe, the God who created everything, hears the cry and the oppression of the Israelite people. And his response is not, well, there's nothing I can do. It's not indifference. Instead, he says, okay, I'm going to come down and rescue my people. I'm going to come down and save my people. I'm not going to sit back and watch this injustice. I'm not going to sit back and see them enslaved and do nothing. I'm going to come down and rescue my people. And so God tells Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh. And you're going to say to Pharaoh, let my people Go. But he's not going to listen. And so God is going to send his justice that's going to come in the form of these ten plagues. And the plagues are the way that God says, hey, hey, Pharaoh, there is a way out. It does not have to go this way. If you will listen to me, and if you will stop holding these people as slaves, then I will show you mercy. I will show you grace. And Pharaoh has the opportunity to say, okay, I don't want to experience it in this way. I don't want to continue to keep slaves. But Pharaoh doesn't. And over and over, we hear a phrase, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Just as he said. And for six of the ten plagues, it alludes to the fact that Pharaoh hardened his heart toward God and towards this request. And for four other plagues, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, which kind of brings up some interesting questions theologically, because we get Moses, or we get, 
excuse me, Pharaoh hardening his own heart. But what about God hardening his heart? Does God cause this to happen by doing this to Pharaoh? So the word in Hebrew for harden is the word kavod. And kavod means weight or significance, and it's to make heavy. Think of it in terms like this. Someone makes their will heavy. I I think the best way you could describe it is being stubborn. Anyone relate to this phrase? I'm not stubborn. My way is just better. Most of us are probably pretty stubborn people. And when I am stubborn, here's what I think I look like. When in all actuality, when I'm stubborn, here's what I probably actually, what my wife sees. (laughs) Or maybe this. (laughs) Right? We are stubborn people. I'm not stubborn. My way is just better. So last night, I was kind of going through prep and, and working on stuff, and I asked my wife, I said, hey, can you think of a time that I was really stubborn? She, she had a few to choose from, and so she was telling me stories, and it was making me upset because those were not all true. And in the middle of that, I get a text, and the text came from my mother, and it said, tomorrow is St. Pat's Day. Protect yourself and wear green. So I Google a color wheel, and I found the opposite end. Red, because you're not going to tell me what to wear. Now, I listened to my mom. (laughs) I have green socks on. I just couldn't let people know. But but there is that side of us, right, that that is really stubborn and just like, I don't want to do what anyone else tells me I have to do. Because I'm in control, and I'm in charge, and I don't want to listen to anyone else. That's Pharaoh. That's the Pharaoh in you, and that is the Pharaoh in me. I don't really want to listen to what you say I need to do. Because I know what's best for me. Now, it's really interesting in the Scriptures, in Hebrew Scriptures, that word kavod is used quite a few different ways at different times. One of those is in Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments. He says, honor, that word is kavod, your father and your mother. That's why I wore green socks. Honor, kavod, right? Make them heavy in your eyes. Make them significant in your eyes. They matter. And then in Exodus 33, then Moses says to God, this is Moses on the mountain, he says, Now show me your glory. Show me your significance. I want to see who you are, your essence. And I think it's fascinating the, the rabbis will say that when he says he hardened Mo or excuse me, Pharaoh's heart. That word is kavod. He made heavy. He strengthened his resolve. He hardened his will. In essence, it's like God saying to Pharaoh, okay, if you want to be stubborn and you want to go down this path, I'm just going to allow you to continue in that direction. 
You could even say, go to Pharaoh, for I have honored his heart. I have allowed Pharaoh and his stubbornness to win. Now, here's my guess. There are those moments in your life where God has stood back and allowed your stubbornness to win. And you have hardened your resolve. And God has honored your will. And because of that, you're going to face the consequences for where you have gone. And my guess is most of us, if not all of us, have pieces of our life today that are still impacted by those decisions of stubbornness we made. Because we have this grand idea, well, if people knew the right thing to do, then they would do it. But I think that's one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves. If Pharaoh had free will, and gave him, God gave him the opportunity to step away. But it was his stubbornness and desire to do what he wanted to do, and no one else can tell him because he's Pharaoh and he's in charge. I think that's the point. You ever heard the phrase, oh, just follow your heart? I think that's what Pharaoh did. He just followed his heart. And the problem is that so often our heart does not lead us down healthy paths. So often our heart takes us in directions that we never wanted to go. Egypt has been blessed. And at the end of the day, they created a world that they don't want to be a part of. Right now, they do, because they're in charge. But if they weren't the ones in charge, they would never want to be a part of that world. Maybe we could ask the question like this, if I were to switch places with blank, would I want to be part of that world? Egypt, if you were to switch places with Israel, would you want to be part of that world? And it's interesting. As God brings them out into the promised land, as He rescues them, Israel begins to take slaves. The very world they hated being a part of they started to create. And as long as you're the one in power and control, it's all okay. That kind of slavery is fine. But when you're the slave, maybe it's not so great. And God sends this ninth plague Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Let's read, the Lord honored Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. And so God says, I'm going to rescue I'm going to come down and save. And he gives them a way to remember what this night is going to hold. 
And so he says, then they are to take some of the blood after they've killed a lamb and put it on the sides and top of the door frames of their houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread along, excuse me, and bread made without yeast. Do not let the meat, do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your waist, into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike. And so God is going to give them this celebration. A way to remember what He is fixing to do. Right, as he's telling them about this Passover meal that they will eat for generations to come, he has not yet passed over the people. Skipping down to verse 21. And then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood, dip the blood in the, in the basin, and put some, some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, He will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses or strike you down. You say, well, why is the blood necessary? Well, I mean, it, it's necessary because of Israel's sin that led them to Egypt in the first place. Right? The sins of Joseph's brothers. It's necessary because the sins of Egypt are continuing to keep them there as slaves. And the blood is used as a mark to separate them so that they are different from everyone else. And the blood became their identity. And it was the blood that would keep them safe from the consequences of sin. Their only hope was that the blood of the Lamb would cover them through the night. But no. 
mercy You come to my rescue You come to my rescue You come to my rescue God comes to the rescue of His people. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. And yet, still inside of them, just like inside of us, is the stubbornness. Because as Israel gets to the Red Sea, to the edge of the water, They want to turn back. They want to return to their sin master, to their slave drivers. Because that's what they know. And it is the blood stained wood. that keeps them safe through the night. Through the Lamb, Yahweh rescues the Israelites from their slavery to Pharaoh. Several thousand years later, God comes down once again. This time as one of us into the mess that we've made. And through Jesus, Yahweh rescues the world from slavery of sin and death. Once again, God sees the misery of His people and He comes down to rescue. 